ียงสวยใช่ตอนนี้แดดเรียงแสบแดดเป็นาวเลยพรุ่งนี้ยังจะมีโอกาสสวัสดีครับท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่านผู้ชมท่
Residency Program Director at John Hopkins University of Maryland and Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Today he's going to give us a, 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 to give us a talk about the global cleft lip and pilot. Please welcome uh, Professor Richard Bradley. When I graduated from college back in the 80s, uh, I went to this country, uh, which is called the Central African Republic. It's a very small country. It has about two million people in there. And I got a master's degree in aquaculture, which is fish farming. I lived up in this portion of the country for a couple of years, and I taught the people in this village to raise freshwater fish uh, as an animal source of protein. And I spent the following couple years down in this area studying lowland gorillas as a biologist. And it's a pretty, pretty basic country. Uh, they have very little running water, very little electricity. And this is me about uh, 25 uh, years ago. And we used to dig these ponds that were about 10 meters by 10 meters and raise this fish, which is called talabi. Uh, people lived what we thought was a pretty simple life. Uh, you had markets like this. This is where you bought your food. This was the hut that I lived in. And my neighbor who lived over here uh, was this gentleman right here. And he was a furniture maker, and he also built huts for people. And the reason I, I bring this up is he had six children, and four of the children were always outside playing with the other village children. And he had two children that for four years I only caught glimpses of looking out a window. And one of his daughters had this disease right here. And this is called no This is not her, uh, but this is a picture to represent her. At the time, I was not a medical person, so I really didn't understand what this was. But this is a gangrenous stomatitis, and it infects really the poorest of the poor children in the entire world. It's rapidly progressive. It's almost uniformly fatal. About 100,000 children a year die of this. And what happens is these kids are very malnourished. They get an infection. It eats away at their face and it ankyloses their jaw so they can't chew, and they eventually die of starvation. The other child that he had was this child, and this is a child that has something called a Tessier four facial cleft, and if you remember from medical school embryology, the body can form all of these clefts within the face, and this child had a Tessier four facial cleft. And it not only involves the soft tissue, but it involves the bone. They're very difficult to fix. And for children that live in a country like the Central African Republic, they really don't ever stand a chance. By uh, cleft society is, is a prenatal vitamin during pregnancy to make sure that your vitamin B is okay. Uh, there's a, there, you know, there are things that will cause clefts, and one of them could be severe vitamin deficiency. The other is. Uh, medicine that's taken for epilepsy, some of the anti-seizure medicine is known to cause clefting, but other than that, it's it's really not known. Do you think, do you think the incidence of a cleft lip and pilots are the same all over the, the you know the, the world or just depends on the socioeconomic status? Uh, it doesn't seem to well it, it's there is a lot of thought about the socioeconomic status, but it's never panned out. It's most common in Native American Indians and least common in uh, blacks. So there's definitely ethnic variation, which is not always related to social economic status. No more questions. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. 
Associated Director of the Bangkok Heart Institute, Bangkok Hospital. Sorry, I don't have any CV on here. This is part of the press. Has been changed for the third time. <laughs> International business of the Bangkok Hospital for two years. I have a responsibility for the revenue of about 4,000 4, million baht last year. I think it's my experience. I have a, can have some new thought of idea for the other side. Okay. Let me show you. The topic is AEC, Asian Economy Community and Thai Healthcare. Cup. I will take around 30 to 40 minutes and then wait for the discussion. Around Myanmar, Vietnam, the South East Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, Darussala, and Philippines. If Asian plus one is we call Asian plus one is plus China, the biggest country in the world right now, and Asian plus three is Japan and South Korea, and plus six Australia, New Zealand, and India. Million, million children, US. <laughs> and AEC is we will have a single market and production base. We will have a free flow of goods, free flow of services, free flow of investment, free flow of skilled labor, free flow of capital. <laughs> AEC is a national agenda right now. The both government from Kuna Visit. The, 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 ex, the former Prime Minister and the current Prime Minister, Kun Ying Lam, uh, decided to have for Thai government as the national agenda. Just to add up a little information, part three in Thailand is still in Thai because we think that you know, in order to communicate with the Thai patient, they, are, we be, they must be able to speak Thai. Mm -hmm. I know that. Currently, I mean, we have some other, other doctors from other countries, like Korean doctor, Japanese doctor. They can, can take their own people in Thailand. A lot, a lot of Thailand, Thai people here come from Korea, come from Japan. And it's not fair for that people. It's not fair for Thai people in, in, in other countries. You know. They are going to get a Thai doctor to take care of them. And then we are still thinking about economy. You think about the need of the people, the need of the people. And, and, and that's why decision has made was made by the medical council. I know that, that's for economy, yeah. but not for other people need. Okay. Yes. Well, this is my last question. Only the last question. And I can promote. Um, <clears throat> Maybe in a future event, if I'm fortunate enough, I can use the wonderful survey to assist me. Before that, tell me a little bit, okay? So, 75% so of your revenue is from the, the Thai people, you know, yes. right? Can you give me a breakdown as to what percent there are self pay, medical insurance pay, and what percent there is batong? Because I may have a problem with batong. In Bangkok, hospital is a very less from the Bangkok. You are a public duty in Bangkok. Very, very less. Just only uh, we have an agreement with Sopo Sochor 
I don't know in, in English. So to pay coverage for the cancer people. Uh, National Health Service Organization. Just only that we have got a lot of patients from the Bangkok by the cancer because of in in public and in medical school and hospital cannot take care all of the the patient. So some patient under Bangkok move to get the treatment in in uh, Bangkok hospital and can. Uh, reimbursed by the Bangkok. So I, I still don't get the figure, so the majority are the self-pay? Uh, majority are the self-pay and 89 private, pay, private insurance oh. and corporate welfare. Okay, so just, just, just a little bit aside. You can honor, for example, a book of issue from the U.S. and Medicare? Oh, yes, we reimburse with the Medicare. You need authorization either? Yes, that's right. We do? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very provocative uh, talk. And I was just wondering, how does this fit into the whole concept of the aging population, which I'm sure is aging as quickly in Thailand as it is in the United States, and we project tremendous jumps by 2020 with an accompanying major jump in the shortage of physicians. <coughs> so we predict for 2020 to have a shortage of about 90,000 physicians, about 40,000 surgeons for a population of 300 million. And I expect when you start putting all your countries together in the complex, that you're going to lend up more or less, you're going to lend up with more than 300 million people, with many more aging population, and with much greater shortage of overall physicians. So despite all the buildings that you put up, and all the hospitals, you still need doctors to take care of patients. And how do you propose to do that? Are you going to build more medical schools? Are you going to train more teachers? Are you going to pay more teachers? Are you going to attract more doctors to study medicine instead of computer science, which pays much more than doctors? The new Minister of Public Health just declared his policy to have a PPP, public-private partnership, to let the, pri the private hospital to affiliate to join the training with the medical school just at Chiang Mai, Sri La or Jula. So in the, in the future, I don't know how many years, maybe 10 years, we can have the private medical school in Thailand, but not now. Now it's the affiliate, affiliation. Affiliation is mean not, not a decrease the Thai quota. The, the, Thai, the Thai doctor quota not increased. Add up. The Thai doctor quota is 100%. We can add on to 5% by year or maybe 7% by year. Yes, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I just want to add question, uh, I think it's truly amazing that you spent only $4 million to build a big hospital in, in Burma. Does it have any equipment? <laughs> yes, it have a, a one CT scan to hemodialysis and uh, have a digital x-ray, digital feed. And the next we will, we will uh, buy the MRI. Most of them is the second hand, not, not the new one. We, we buy the, the second hand from the Japan and Thailand. And all the bed is, they have a 50 beds in, in Yangon, in this hospital. 70% 70, 70 is the uh, automatic bed, the other is manual bed. I hope you still have uh, time for question. Uh, fascinating talk, and I think uh, this is a lot of thing for our U.S. physician to learn, and I, I'm in private practice, and I look, look at your numbers, it's amazingly 
compare, they're competitive compared to the U.S. dollar. You mentioned some of the hospital, I look at the picture, the size of the hospital, so you have a budget of four million U.S. dollars, on a yearly budget. And those, those size, you know, I mean, I don't have an exact number, but compared to our hospital in Sumter, South Carolina, uh, we have 180 physicians on staff and uh, 260 bed. Our budget is uh, over $100 million per year and compared to only $4 million. And I think it's uh, that this dichotomy of these uh, dollars, and it's amazing. I think it's a lot of lesson for us to learn. I think it's, uh, this is an opportunity. I think you're, you're grabbing the right opportunity. I mean, you're a lot more competitive. Just like uh, any corporate corporation, for example, uh, uh, you know, why, why the iPhone uh, manufacturer in, in China? Because their wages are much lower. And uh, I think this is a thing that we have to think about. If the wages are lower, all the technology, everything, all your know-how, you do much more competitive compared to the U.S. Now, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. So, thank you very much. Oh. Now, I would like to know from your corporation that uh, how much did you contribute to the uh, government sector of the medical school to produce all these doctors to supply to you? They need 350. 50,000 baht per year, only for, for the, the training. The other is maybe, so I think with that number, we, we can do we can do 100 doctors per year, it's very easy. Not only Thai doctor, we can train the Myanmar doctor, the Lao doctor, because I think the sustainable solution for the medical hub or medical tourism or AEC in Thailand, not only for by, by the financing problem, we have to build the Sira, Jula, or even Chiang Mai to be a Stanford or to be the Harvard of the AEC. So by the training, we keep them. Well, I, my question is, how much did you contribute this year to all these medical school? Not the, the statistic of how much they spend the money for the, uh, each student. I can, I can answer under my responsibility is more than 20 million now. Of only my, 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 uh, my part. But I, did, I do believe in uh, my network more than that. Thank you. One last question. Okay, thanks. Um, I have one question. If I want to go to uh, Singapore or any uh, center of your bank or hospital, um, how can I do it? <laughs> Who are yeah, you? I want to work in my hospital. If you graduate, and I, I want you to just fly with me this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know about that. If I want to um, work with you in the bank of hospital, um, I must get that from the US or any abroad. You, you, if you want to be a practitioner here, you have to have yeah, got the license from the Thai Medical Council first. Uh, right now, this year, the, the examination is still in Thai language, so you have to learn Thai and answer in Thai. Not, not, not difficult. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs>
microphone. And, uh, I'm afraid that my talk will narrow down the target considerably as I talk to you about the field of transplantation, if I can make this work. How, how much I make a phone? Can someone help me? <coughs> so, my topic is to talk to you about some of the major problems with renal transplantation. And I chose to talk about a very broad problem that really involves the whole world in terms of transplants, and that is insufficient number of donor organs. And the way that we have approached it at our institution, where we do about 600 to 700 transplants per year of all organs. So it's a very busy center doing about 100 heart transplants, 250 kidneys, about 20, 30 pancreases, and so on, and lungs, and so on. Uh, so the problem, for example, with kidney transplantation is as shown here that the prevalence of renal disease is, uh, as shown here, is very doing living donors is almost the first line of defense. I can understand the lack of uh, cadaveric donors in the country. And obviously for little children, this is a possibility. Uh, but it is a tricky, it's a very tricky business to do living donors in livers. Uh, we have a fairly extensive experience with this. Uh, and I was wondering uh, what the intent of the unit is going to be in terms of trying to encourage deceased donor liver transplants at a higher level. This obviously applies as well to the kidneys. Uh, because uh, these are uh, the kidneys I, I would see as, as being much more promising in terms of using living donors as much as possible initially uh, in order to expedite and grow a program so that it attracts enough attention that disease donors are directed that way as well and it makes enough publicity to do it. With uh, liver, it's a different problem because of the technical difficulties. So I wonder how you're going to approach it uh, in terms of the future when you take over the program. Are you going to continue to emphasize the living organ donation, which now can be done laparoscopically at our institution, or whether you're going to make a major effort get more cadaver donors, particularly for your patients with uh, cancer, who may not make it. Oh, I think my business. In France, it's actually a sort of mix that nobody really knows what they're doing. But, the, uh, but in Belgium and Austria, it's very interesting because the law actually in Belgium, it was done both ways. And the law changed around, I think, beginning of the 90s. And all of a sudden, from being an importer of kidneys, they became an exporter of kidneys to the rest of Eurotransplant. They doubled and tripled their organ donation rate by changing that law. So I wonder whether you have any chance of pushing that kind of law in Thailand. Thank you so much for your questions. As uh, the doctor, uh, Professor Hardy tells us that uh, Belgium, France have the law that the dead people, all of dead people are the donor. But by law in Thailand, only brain dead criteria not accept for the general population in Thailand. But by law, but not general population. Only brain dead in some part of the country he not dead. He was not dead. Just only by law. Brain death just only by law. Not by belief of general population in Thailand. So it's very difficult to 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 tell that to tell them that they they was dead. So this is uh, this is one of the problems. 
uh, about uh, the, 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 uh, what, what the way we, we improve the organ donation uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, the government, national, national health security office, Sopo Social. Sopo Social. Sopo Social. Sopo Social. The official name is National Health Security Office. <laughs> Support living and catering, kidney transplant, uh, organ transplantation for all, but no donor. Today, Thailand do kidney transplantation for free, but no donor. This is the problem of Thailand. National Health Security uh, Office support all, but no donor. Uh, the other part will be the expand about the by law, uh, about the, like a pair exchange program, but in Thailand it's not, uh, not yet available now because of uh, the law is not open for this time. Just only living emotional related donor lives found that have to live together more than three years. Or they have children uh, together. This is the, 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 the kidney transplantation uh, that limited by law. So this is the, the pair exchange program cannot be done. Living unrelated donor cannot be done. Because of by law, we cannot. It's going to be illegal in some part to expand the number of kidney transplant in Thailand. And the most, uh, the most problem should be old-fashioned belief. We don't know that dead people that have been removed the organ in this life maybe no organ in the next life. <laughs> this is the belief in Thailand, but this is a, the, 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 the solution about social communication to the general population in Thailand. This is some, some, some problem that we have at the moment, but maybe uh, the Ethic, uh, the system of coordinator, organ coordinator, because it's not so strong in Thailand. Oh, the, the, best, the best hospital that have the effective, effective coordinator system is Udon Thani Hospital and Sapasit Thipasol Udon Hospital. They can find they can have the uh, organ supply so much. This is the best one for Udon Thani Hospital in Thailand. Just, just, uh, just a little comment. Uh, I think there may, there may be uh, an interesting issue that I have to for a while. That even a person in the health system that includes uh, the doctor, the nurse, or maybe a professor in Thailand, the, really don't know too much about the, the organ transplantation. In, in, I think in some meeting, uh, they asked the panel that uh, who is uh, have the donor card? <laughs> nothing, nothing. Because uh, the, the, the organ transplantation is, is not in, in, in your mind, in, even in the people in the, in the health system. So this is a problem. I think we need to uh, move to the next topic because we are running out of time. I'd like to uh, conclude this, um, you know, the uh, liver and kidney transplantation from Chiang Mai University. I think that we, probably will be our vision, the uh, surgical department, one of the vision to revive the liver transplantation program. We have still have a lot of work to do. We need to build uh, our human resources. We need to do more campaign on the donors for the vote for liver and kidney transplantation. I think that's probably one of the uh, main mission in the, in the near future. And next uh, topic, we'll welcome back uh, Professor Mark Hardy. He's going to switch his topic. He will talk to us about global surgery, this uh, 
the surgical care for the rest of the world. Oh no, no. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got the wrong title. The title should be selection, training, and evaluation of general surgeons of the future. Professor Hardy. Thank you very much. It's Again, many thanks for having me here as part of this important uh, meeting of the uh, Joint Thai American uh, Society uh, and, and this lovely area. Uh, the variety of talks is uh, really very impressive and uh, I must say I enjoy participating in this type of discussion. This sort of takes me to another part of my career because I was a program director in surgical residency at Columbia for more than 10 years. Uh, again, in the past, a little bit in the past at least. Uh, and uh, I was really uh, very stimulated to look at the whole concept of selection training, uh, which is uh, really the one here is really quite impressive. So, what is a surgeon? How do we select them? What does he or she need to know? The whole concept of general versus specialist is one that is facing ours more and more. As our population grows, the need for the general surgeon, and particularly in many parts of the world, where there are large rural areas with very distances, the concept of the general surgeon that is slowly disappearing in our medical school training, our residency training, is a major issue. And how do we train them now with the insistence of new laws about how to practice, how to get rewarded for the practice, how to actually uh, beat themselves in other fields. I look for super athletes. So if I see an Olympic champion who happens to have very good grades, they are almost automatically in the program. If I see a prima ballerina who danced for three, four years and who has pretty good grades, doesn't have to have the best grades, but just good grades, she'll be in. Because I feel that people who have dedicated themselves to a specific task and become excellent at it, really excellent, are the kind of people we want to be surgeons. We can be dedicated, we can have the determination to study, to determination to excel, and those are the people that I would like to be my surgeon when I need it, not too fast. The, uh, the same applies, obviously, to classical pianists. I've had all of them. I've had concert pianists. I've had an, uh, two Olympic champions in weird specialty, but uh, wrestlers and so on. So it is possible. Then we invite them for interviews, and there the interview process is varied. So then we invite them with the residents to meet. And also, uh, <laughs> Professor Mir Tsai Dawaro has been uh, working very hard for our morning.
you know, the whole thing. It's all like a great. I thought I don't know. Well, I don't know. <laughs> so I'm sorry. All of you, all of you are eating. ก็แฟนไปไหนเนี่ยอ่าอัดอัดอัดด้วยเนี่ยเนี่ยอ่าเดี๋ยววิดีโอวิดีโอแล้วก็ส่งยูทูบให้ดูอ่าก็แฟน